I'm Stefan Bauman. I would like to invite you on a special journey. A journey of exploration. To discover the splendor. To feel the excitement. And to experience the wonders of painting outdoors. In one of America's most stunning locations, I invite you to come to the Grandview Ranch and see for yourself what a weekend can do to transform your art. Everything you need to know is on our website, www.stephanbauman.com. This is my long weekend, so bear with me. I started off in uh, Monday morning. I, I have coaching that starts at 4.30 in the morning. Coached till nine, got in a car, drove all the way to San Francisco, coached that night, got up the next day, coached all day, drove last night, started this morning at 4.30, coached for five hours, and then drove, picked up Chris and came down. So when I actually threw down the gauntlet and say, how many of you at, at home at YouTube could actually produce a painting a day. And I got pledges from anywhere between four and 16. Some people thought they could do 16 paintings in a week, which is totally unreasonable. <laughs> it doesn't do any good to pledge for something that you can't accomplish. It's a waste of my time. Furthermore, I, ha I had students that pledged eight and some of these are my coaching students. So she, one of the students had pledged, pledged eight paintings. And so she told me on Saturday she was going to paint eight. And so Saturday, um, I, I gave her the homework assignment. She pledged eight. Sunday morning, I'm doing my work, and all of a sudden I get an email. One down. <laughs> First thing Sunday morning. I mean, she got up. She's on fire. Half an hour goes by. Two down. <laughs> An hour later, three down, four down, and so I had to stop her. Whoa! Let's take a look at what's going on. It's not good to do your homework assignment without intentional. And so if you're going to do a homework assignment, it has to start off with absolutely every focus, every bit of your, your, your being to make sure the drawing's right. And it's really, really important to paint what you see. That process for beginning students may take eight hours to do a painting that's of any, any decency. But the key to this process is at the end of six or eight hours, you should be able to take that painting and throw it in the trash. Because it's not the painting that we're after, it's the practice. Well, I'm not practicing on um, that oil. Then you're not practicing with everything you got. <laughs> That's expensive. I know, but, but being extraordinary is expensive. Being extraordinary is, 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 is going beyond the worries of money, worries of time. It is about being present right now and painting with no agenda whatsoever. No agenda whatsoever as far as getting the painting done. It's about pushing yourself beyond the limits that you normally set for yourself. Uh, to be extraordinary, you have to go beyond your, your normal and go into extraordinary. That means if the cost of the canvas has cost you more, so be it. If you don't have the time, make it. Now, one of my students said yesterday, Lucy, she goes, I don't have time to paint. I tried to paint. She pledged four paintings in two weeks which wasn't an extraordinary task, but she, that was, she figured out what she could do. She came to class with one barely finished. And I said, what, why didn't you get your painting done? And she said, I had no time. And I said, well, you couldn't find time to, to paint? She goes, no, 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 I'm so busy, my family, my, you know. And I said, okay, so 
what time do you get up? And she told me she gets up at 6. I said, so what does your morning look like? She says, well, she's from Colombia, so she's, you know what that's Lots like. Lots of Latinos. Lots of Latinas. And she's a spitfire, I love her. If you ever met her, you would love her too. But anyway, so she says, she gets up, she makes the bed, because her mom told her to do that. Okay, so she's still in that habit. And then she vacuums the house and cleans it, because she can't do anything unless the house is clean. Now that's something that she, yeah, so she's got, yeah, so, there's, so that's, that's in her schedule. And I said, Lucy, you know, when you pass away, whenever you do, 20, 30 years from now, they're not going to say, oh, Lucy, she kept such a marvelous house. It was always cleaned and spotful. That's not going to be her significance. The first they're going to say is Lucy was quite an artist. And the church is going to be filled with her paintings. I know I've seen students that have passed away. And I'll tell you, you know, when you don't think your family cares about your paintings, wait till your, your day of your funeral. When you're shining down in your church and you see your kids ripping apart the church trying to get the paintings that they want. Because you created them. You know, imagine if you inherited something from your mother. Yeah, you can get the gold earrings and the gold jewelry. And let's face it, those are out of style. You wouldn't wear them anyway. So you're kind of greedy and think that they're valuable somehow. You know, like you would actually sell your mother's wedding ring. I mean, you know, that, that's like sacrilegious. And if you did, they would only give you the price of the gold. So it's not really worth it. Right? And everybody fights over that. And what does it mean anyway? It's just metal. But your artwork. Imagine if you had a ch an opportunity to actually inherit your grandmother's paintings, your, your, your mother's paintings. They become heirlooms and they become cherished items. So your family's family is going to want your paintings. Far more than you having a clean house. So I told her, you know, having, I understand that having a clean house is important. And it's so important, you'll make sure that that's taken care of. So if you got up, made the bed, and then you actually go into your studio and you start a painting. And you put two hours in the painting, and then be began your day. At some point during your day, you'd squeeze in the vacuum because that's so important. So anyway, it's all, about, it's all about decisions that you make to be able to do that. Painting is an important thing that you can do, and you have to make time for it, and you have to find time. And sometimes people put painting off to the last because they feel like it, it is such a luxury. Somehow we carry this idea that being an artist is something that other people do. And if you even think about being an artist, it's like, how dare you? You're, you're going to be a slob. You're going to be down selling your work at Fisherman's Wharf. You're going to be a hippie and yeah, smoke dope. Yeah, a good place to sell. <laughs> yeah, I, hey, listen, I, you know, when my father said, yeah, you want to be an artist? You want to go sell your paintings at Fisherman's Wharf? And I go, yeah. I looked at him, he owned the bakery, and I, you know, I was like looking at him, he's getting up at 3.30 in the morning, having to go through the snow to get to the bakery so he could like make donuts. I'm like going in comparison, being an artist at the wharf seems a little nicer. Without practice, we're not going to see any growth. And so this exercise of pledging four, six, eight paintings is about you getting better. And already, since I've posted the YouTube videos, I'm getting people that are sending me thank you notes saying just painting three days and three paintings, they've already seen an improvement on how they're painting. And that's under a week. That's how extraordinary practice is. You have no idea until you get three or four under your belt where you're going to be painting. And some of you are, are going, well, you know, I got to finish this. It's not about finishing. It's about the practice. And like I said, you have to practice so intentional that at the end of the day, you throw it away because that painting has no value. It's all what's ab absorbed in your head. You're getting ready for tomorrow's painting, huh? Isn't it good though to pull them out a long time from now and say, oh, no. man, look no. at that. Like, look how much I've no. improved. No, 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 <laughs> no. It has as much value if, if, if you were playing the piano or a musical instrument and you practiced for a half an hour and you taped it, and then you put the tape in storage for a year and came back and sat there and listened to it, it's a waste of time. Because you're in a different place altogether.
could probably take a picture and revel in it. But the thing is, you're still putting too much focus in the value of that sketch. The sketch has no value, whether or not you did it good or bad. And the problem is, is that when you do it bad, you carry that baggage with you. And then now you're going to be comparing your bad to how you paint a year from now. And all of a sudden, yeah, you look good. But the thing is, that exercise wasn't meant to be good or bad. It's just an exercise. So you really have to get that this is an exercise. At the end of the exercise, the only thing that you get out of it is the practice in your brain, your hand, and your eyes. It's training your senses. When you go to college, every day they have you draw. Every day you do 60 drawings. Half hour, 60 drawings. Boom, 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 boom. You think you have any time in your life to ever go back and look at all those stacks? When I got through college, I had a stack of drawing tablets that were this high. Every day I would go in and, and finish and I would throw the tablet into the stack. And after a semester or two, they start getting pretty high. Do you think I'm ever going to go down to the bottom and figure out where I was? Do you think I'm going to go down there and sell anything that's down there? Because I'm now up here. If I'm up here now, why would I even bother selling that? Why would you bother your, worry about what your study is? It's down here somewhere. What we're shooting for is like mastery here. You want to master painting? This is how you get there. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice, practice, practice. It's not a location. It's a, it's a destination to point your career. If you want to have a painting in, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you're not going to get there if you don't practice. And you're not going to learn how to practice if you put significance in your practice. Well, isn't all of the work that we're doing in your practice? It's practice, but it's very slow. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, five weeks. <laughs> Six weeks on a painting. Yeah, it is. Now, when I tell students, especially when I'm coaching them, I tell them, look, I w at the end of the year, I would rather have you do 50 paintings than two. Now, yes, you can do two paintings a year. And they can be really, really extraordinary because in a year you can dry it, you can repaint it, you can retrace it, you can start all over again, and you can paint it again. And anybody with any kind of common sense can produce a masterpiece if they put a year to it, right? It's not extraordinary to kind of guess your way up to a painting. That's not extraordinary. It's not extraordinary to be able to fix things as you go along for a year. That's not extraordinary. What's extraordinary is to sit down in a couple of hours and paint something that's absolutely gorgeous. That's extraordinary and be done with it. And that's what we're training you to do is to do that. It's not the time that you spend, it's the mastery of your craft. And we all marvel at people who sit down at the piano and be able to play like this, yeah. right? But yeah. nobody's listening to their old tapes of their practice. It's that moment in time. You're not painting great masterpieces in this class, so get over it. <laughs> You're learning how to paint. You're learning how to paint in this class. Your job is to just practice that and get really good at it. And one day when I'm not here anymore, you'll be able to do it yourself. And you could have your own classes then. And you'll be able to produce a painting a day and just go boom. And have everybody applaud like at the end of a piano piece. But the key to it is that you cannot just put one painting after another after another. It's not about quantity. And if you can't pledge seven paintings in one week, don't. Be reasonable. And if you can pledge seven paintings but you don't have a lot of time, be reasonable with your subject matter. It doesn't matter what you paint. I have you paint cosmetics and uh, plastic uh, bottles and all this stupid stuff. Why? Just to give you something to paint. But if you don't practice, you're going to be at the same level. And then I have students that kind of chime in at the end and go, well, how come everybody else in class does those studies so well and I don't? It's because those people have spent a year practicing their butt off. And if you notice the students who come in every week committed that they're going to do the homework assignments, they grow faster. There's no secret. There's no secret to this painting. There's, yes. What? But I have a question, a statement. 
You see her some homeworks. Lottie, beautiful with her homeworks. They are beautiful, put yeah. out beautiful homeworks. So you're saying it doesn't matter. You don't have to have it beautiful. It's a matter of putting them out. Mm -hmm. So if you think of it that way, then you almost have to throw away the thinking of making it beautiful. Exactly. Even the homework assignment this week was what? Something, okay, something that you love. Yeah. Something you care about, something you treasure. Something that you think is a family heirloom. To dig that thing out and paint it, that's the homework assignment this week, right? It's kind of a trick question because we don't paint things. So whatever you come up with, it's just a story behind the thing. And I don't really care what that is. Ultimately, it's lights and darks and color and shadows and contrasts. Whatever you bring to it is fine, but you know, and it makes it more important because the week before I'm asking for things in your in your drawers, and the week before that I'm asking for cosmetics. You know, so you're a lot of you are rushing through, going, "I hate painting cosmetics. It's a stupid wise." So I'll give you something to paint that's really beautiful. Now a lot of you are running around the house all week trying to figure out what that is, and what is my definition of beauty? I mean, some people think what's beautiful. I look at it and go, that's tacky. <laughs> it's the eye of the beholder in, it, in itself. And the thing is, you know, a lot of people want to, you know, it's like I know when I was in piano classes, I'd go, I want to paint, I want to play the sting, you know, from the entertainer. Da, 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 da. But I wanted to play that because that was my era when I was little and everybody was playing that. I want to play that. And my teacher, who was Czechoslovakian, said, you will play the scales. I'd go, but, but you, will play, you will do the scales for a year before you play one song. And so for a whole year, for an hour a day, I would be playing scales while everybody else was playing the entertainer. <laughs> that had to be a little upsetting to you? Well, yeah, because it's like you guys sitting here and having me tell you to throw your paintings away at the end of the day. Because it's practice. But you know what? After that year, I could play the entertainer really well because my fingers were all limbered up and I had all that stuff under my... because it's all repeating notes and numbers and stuff. But not only that, I could also play Beethoven's Fifth. I could play Moonlight Sonata and I could play Mozart. Not just the entertainer. And so had I just played the entertainer and spent a year on that, that's all I would know. So sometimes in the coaching, you don't know what you don't know. But all I can tell you is if you, if, you, if you read what people are saying and if you listen to what my students are saying who are taking the pledge and doing this homework assignment, you just might find something extraordinary. But you've got to proceed with the right frame of mind. It's about practicing. And Molly, when you finish your paintings on your expensive canvases, you can always go back and make class projects of them because there might be a good foundation. So you have your homework, and then you have your class projects. Now at times, your homework is so extraordinary. Remember I told you about Ken? He took on doing a painting a day for 30 days. Now you took that pledge last year, Dottie. and Dottie took that pledge. Um, didn't you take it too? Mm -hmm. OK. So did you learn something from that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Can you put it into words, or is it just, uh, just an overall? Well, number one, I learned that I can stretch myself a whole lot further. Mm -hmm. And I also have a well of creativity that I didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. And the third thing would be, I think my painting got better. Yeah. And it was just, you know, I learned a lot. I mean, that's not all I learned. Yeah, yeah. And did every painting turn out really no. great? No. No, but they all are paintings I could go back and rework. Yeah, but if you did, fine. If you didn't, but the value of doing them overall has improved your artwork. The discipline itself is just worth its weight in gold. Yeah. The discipline is amazing. And the thing is, when I teach the Power to Create class, I get 16 students. And with those 16 students, I have them do five paintings a week of the same subject. So I'll tell them, I want you to paint a glass of water on a white surface. And I want you to, to give me five different variations of that. Mm -hmm. The first two are easy, the last three are hard. And I have 16 students that do all that and then we go and critique. And your limitations end with what you know. 
and then all of a sudden you see everybody else is dealing with how do I make that happen and you see a lot of interesting things start to happen not because of the one not because of the two it's because of the five and if you can pledge to do two paintings a week that's not extraordinary you're looking at your time going oh well on Thursday I don't have an appointment I could probably put a couple of hours in and Saturday I might have a few minutes that's not being an extraordinary painter that's not somebody who really wants to learn how to do this and it's not to be a master painter but you want to be good at this you're spending time on it you want to be good at this so what a master does is that they raise their hand and say I'll do seven and with doing seven there's a commitment there and I found that when I asked people to do a lot they actually did more than what they thought they could do Levon, who's one of my students she said that she was much more intentional about getting through the grocery store so she could get home and snatch some painting time and then when she would like you know swing by the antique store she'd say no I gotta get home and paint there's a lot of little intentional things when your mother calls God, she's going to be on there for an hour, you just don't take her call. There's a lot of things that you do, like vacuuming first thing when you get up, which is just crazy. You should be like other people and vacuum once a year. But anyway. <laughs> Nobody cares if you vacuum anymore. That's just an old, that's old school. The only time you have to worry is when your mother comes to visit, right? Okay. So anyway, so it's about being intentional about your practicing, and I know I'm harping on you, and, and assure you, this is like one of the last weeks that we're going to have this. But it really shouldn't be. You know, it's funny when I mentioned that we were going to do doodle books. I had everybody doing doodle books. You guys were all doodling every week. Remember we had doodle books everywhere. Remember that? And we would like sit there and we'd go, oh, this is Jan's doodle book, look at this, oh look at, you know, I'd say, ha ha, it's your husband, you. Um, you would be in the grocery store. Yeah, you'd be in the grocery store, you'd have people with little carts and stuff. You know, it was a big thing, right? And then we went on to other things. Where are your doodle books now? They're back where they were before we started doodling. What would you be like if you were still doodled? You'd have a stack of books this, this high so far. And the bottom ones would be really ugly, but the top ones would be really great. Remember how I said all professional artists are imposters? All you ever see from the professional artists are these top doodles up here. These top paintings up here. You never see these down here. And that's why you don't want to spend a lot of time going back looking at what you did in the past. You want to throw them away. Frank Lloyd Wright once said to one of his students, if you are going to design anything, make sure you put a lot of planters around your buildings and make sure you plant a lot of ivy because five years from now you're going to wish you never drawed that <laughs> what you're doing today believe me five years from now isn't going to be anything near and if you don't believe me take out some of the paintings you did five years ago and you don't want to go back there so you need to be thinking as this homework assignment as to press forward press forward press forward and what you're doing is not important Keep on doing that. Keep on doing it. Practice, practice. Do some studio work that's important to you. This is just practice. Bourgeroux, who was really famous for doing beautiful women and, and children floating, kind of very French, you know, kind of almost countryside, idealistic Thomas Kincaid old paintings. Um, before he would actually paint, he would spend six hours drawing hands and feet six hours before he started wow. are you kidding no he was not just good at it he was a master i mean it took him six hours to practice just practice what he already knew he already knew how to draw hands and feet from the academy when he left the academy he knew how to do that but to master that he practiced six hours before he would start painting because he figured to do what he needed to do and one of the hardest things to do is hands and feet hmm. And if you look at his hands and feet, you'll go, I can tell. There's nobody in history that painted more beautiful hands and feet than Bourgeois did. And he'll have like cherubs up in the air, you know, or Cupid, 
you know, with his little feet and his little hands and, you know, some woman pushing him back because she doesn't want to fall in love and the Cupid's got his little bow and arrow ready to stab her and she's going, no, no, no! Um, that's all hands and feet in there. Two little faces, but hands and feet. Um, but it takes practice. It takes practice. And if you don't put the practice in, you're not going to get anywhere fast. And all what you, the practice is, put something down, create an effect. An effect is light, because we don't paint things. So when I tell you to paint beautiful things, it's actually a trick question. I don't care. What I want to see is how you handle lights and shadows. And then you paint that how you see it. You paint what you see, Mrs. Gugolinsky. And one of the exercises that you're going to be learning from this exercise is that Mrs. Gugolinsky said, paint what you see. And if you don't know Mrs. Gugolinsky, you've got to go look at my YouTube videos in the past. I mentioned her a lot. But Mrs. Gugolinsky said, paint what you see. But the problem is, we don't know what we're looking at yet. We don't know what we're looking at yet. And what we're looking at is, is altered by our brain. Our left side of the brain, which is so dominant that it changes what you think you see to what it should be, what it thinks it does, but it's not, but it should be, because the left brain says so. And then the right brain goes, it's not like that. And then the left brain goes, shut up. <laughs> I'm present in the art classes, you're not. And your right brain's going, but it's not that color. And the left brain goes, shut up. <laughs> I want that to be this color. The, when I do coaching, the first class that we do is a glass of water. Why? Because it's the one thing most students come into class saying, how do I paint a glass of water? How do I paint something transparent like glass? I go, like what? You know, how do you paint glass? Said, what kind of glass? Oh, I don't know, like a wine glass. Because it's transparent. How do you paint that? I mean, you wrap your head around it. If you haven't done any painting, it's like totally abstract. But the answer is right there in front of you, if you just start looking at it. And once you really look at it, you could start seeing it. Once you see it, you can create it, piece by piece by piece. And once you master that, then not only do you paint what you see, but you start painting what you see. That's when you actually take art to the next level, where you interpret what you see and take it to the next level. That's where the art comes in. So I don't want you to end up being little Xerox machines. That's just the beginning. But you can't do anything with it unless you know what's in front of you. And the way you know what's in front of you is to practice it. In the, pro in the process of practicing, you're practicing your edges, your colors, your brush strokes, your values, your temperatures. Every brush stroke. And when you're doing that, you're becoming an Aller Prima painter. And I have students that come in that have been doing this homework assignment. They go, I heard on the internet about Alla Prima. What does that mean? And basically, it's a, the method of painting like in one sitting, two or three hours. And I go, you've been doing that as homework assignments all year. And they go, oh, well, then why is that such a thing? And I go, because it's a mastery. If you can paint Alla Prima in one sitting, you can master it. But the issue with that is that every brush stroke that goes on has to be correct. And what I see with your homework assignments is that you kind of get, kind of, sort of, and you'll get back to it later. And then you put another color that's kind of close, but you'll deal with it later. Alla Prima isn't that. Alla Prima is to put down one stroke that is perfect. One stroke that's absolutely the right color, the right value, right edges. It's intentional. So the stroke is more important than the subject or the thing. Well, the stroke is your handwriting. You know, when you learn your signature, at some point as little kids, we all just pretend. And some pe uh, women who are getting married, they practice their new name, right? Because, you know, first you were like Alice Smith, and now you're Alice Rampalakas. <laughs> you're like, how do I pump Rampalakas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you sit there. Well, that's, that's what brush strokes are. And, you know, I have students that come in and they go, Oh, God, I need to learn how to get my style. Mm -hmm. You know how you get your style? 
painting from life. You can't get it from copying a photograph. You have to sit in front of something because at that point you're with your model and you have to interpret what you see and it is three-dimensional and you're trying to make it two-dimensional. And however you do that will be your style and then you have to improve that. But how are you going to improve on that? Practice. So some of you did your homework assignment and you were, you were doing um, from photographs. You're not practicing your handwriting. So it's really important to practice. Okay? Any questions? If you like to take your painting to the next level, regardless at whatever level you are, please feel free to contact me at 415-606-9074.